physique. Uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce uh, Emily Cliff. So Emily is currently a new faculty at Sherbrooke University. So, <laughs> University of Sherbrooke, sorry, I don't say that very often in English. <laughs> Um, and prior to that, she held positions in numerous places. So she was a lecturer in pure mathematics at the University of Sydney, Australia. And before that, she was a research assistant professor at Urbana-Champaign. And before that, was a research fellow in geometry and representation theory at Oxford, where she did her PhD under the supervision of Kobe Kremnitzer. Uh, on the topic of universal D modules and factorization structures on Hilbert schemes of points. And Emily is Canadian, I believe, because she did her master's at U of T. So that's correct, Emily. Yeah. And today she'll tell us about moduli spaces of principal two group bundles, other things, which I'm no expert on. And hopefully uh, I'll understand something about well, the reconnection to CFTs, because I know your work connects to conformal field theories. So today will be no exception. Okay, Emily, thanks for joining and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you for the introduction. Um, yeah, I'm very happy to be here. And I hope that now that I'm in Sherbrooke, I'll get a chance to interact with all of you more. Um, so please feel free to interrupt and um, you can type in the chat. I'll try to keep an eye on it, but if I don't notice, then just unmute and shout or whatever, I'll do my best. And please interrupt and ask questions. So this is joint work today with these people, uh, Dan Berwick Evans. Can everyone see my screen, by the way? It's successfully shared, great. Uh, Laura Murray, Pervin Nakata, and Emma Phillips. And then just an acknowledgement here that we started this project at an AMS MRC, that's a mathematical research community on geometric representation theory and equivariant elliptic cohomology. So first of all, thanks to the AMS for the funding. Um, Dan and I organized this along with a few other people, but also an advertisement that MRCs are a very nice program. So if you are a young person and you get a chance to apply, I recommend it. And if you know young people, then I think you should encourage them. I enjoyed it a lot and I think the participants did as well. So here's the plan for the talk. Um, I'll begin with some context and motivation, which hopefully will be motivating. Um, then I'll give some definitions of what, what is a principle group, uh, what is a principal two group bundle, what are the key properties, so the results from our paper, and then finally some applications and some connections to ideas from mathematical physics. To begin, we start with a compact Lie group and a class in the third cohomology, so this SM here is for siegel Mitchison cohomology. For most of the talk it's not important what that means, uh, we'll be dealing with finite groups and you can just think about ordinary group cohomology, so in that case Here's an example. So if G is a finite group, then a representative of a class in cohomology is a map alpha from three copies of G into U1 satisfying a co-cycle condition. And I'll write it just once um, explicitly. So if I have four elements, let's say G, H, K, and L in my finite group, and I apply alpha to them in the following way. So first I take the last three H, K, L, then G appears, multiplies H. So I still only have three factors. Now the H is going to move over, multiply the K, and the K moves over, pair with the L, and finally the L gets bumped out. So we have this formula, um, and this should be equal to one for all. G, H, K, and L. And this formula over here is D alpha. So of G, H, K, and L. Okay, so um, there will be many co-cycles in this talk. I will not write any more formulas of this nature, but this is the basic sort of flavor. Okay, and so what do we do with a compact Lie group and a class in cohomology? Well, one thing we can do is study churn simons theory or uh, in the case that G is finite, this is known as Digraph-Witten theory uh, because Digraph and Witten studied it first and then Fried and Quinn wrote um, a more less terse uh, exposition. So in particular, as a topological quantum field theory, um, it's three-dimensional. So it's gonna assign to every closed three-dimensional manifold a number, but to every 
Riemann surface, it's going to assign a vector space. And what Fried and Quinn do um, is they construct a line bundle L on the moduli space of principal G bundles on all Riemann surfaces. And in particular, that means that for any sigma that is a Riemann surface, so for any choice of sigma, they get a line bundle, which I'll denote by L sub sigma on the moduli space of G bundles on that particular surface. And what's the connection to digraph witten theory? It's that the vector space V sigma that we're interested in is exactly the global sections of this line bundle. I'm sorry to interrupt, probably a very stupid question, but you're referring to G as being finite. Do you mean a compactly group, a finite compactly group, or actually a, a finite group with a finite number of elements? It has a finite number of elements. So what is the G bundle in that case? I mean, it should be... Um, so in this case, right, we can think of our moduli space because G is finite. Um, bundles are the same as flat bundles. And so we have maps like this. We also have an action of G. So to be a line bundle, it, what's really interesting is the G equivariant structure on this, on a collection of vector spaces over this finite set. So this is what we call the Friedquin line bundle. It's also related to uh, elliptic cohomology in the following sense. So if we restrict um, L, so it was a vector bundle, it was a line bundle on the moduli space of um, bundles over all uh, surfaces, but if we just consider surfaces which are so to the moduli space of G bundles on elliptic curves, we obtain another line bundle. So let me just call it L tilde for now. And what Nora Ganter has shown is that this is the natural home of twisted G equivariant elliptic cohomology. So this uh, does, G, does V have a finite dimension? A, I cannot answer that question successfully. I'm sure the answer is known um, and probably not hard. So you don't know if it's finite or infinite? I do not personally at this moment while giving a talk. I have a question sure. that's um, simpler maybe. So is there a reason why you limit yourself to finite groups? Um, is, mathematically, is there a, an obstruction to doing this for, you know, say, SU2 uh, or some more canonical yeah. Lie groups. Um, so, so we'll see that in the, the two group story is much simpler in the finite case. And um, so that's the main reason for the purposes of this project. For the purposes of, of Chern Simon's theory, the story is just much nicer in the finite case. So there, but in general, for Chern Simon's theory, rather than having this line bundle whose sections exactly give you um, your quantum states, you expect a pre-quantum line bundle, and then you have to do polarization. I'm not an expert, but um, to actually produce the quantum states. So they're not literally the sections of this line bundle anymore. For physicists, we usually think about, you know, Chern Simon's action for some gauge group, gauge field, which takes values in a gauge group. Um, is that the same G here? Like, or this refers to another property of the Chern Simon's theory? No, it's, it's, I'm pretty sure it's the same G, yeah. The same G. But write down some action so for non Lie For Chern Simon, it's a Lie group. This is a finite group. This is a, a very boring Lie group. So, but you say that this is, you would take Chern Simon's theory for a gauge field in some non abelian group G, not necessarily finite, okay. um, and then restricted to a finite subgroup, and that's... Um. Like digraph witten theory is really the case where your input Lie group is happens to be a finite group. So it's really a toy model. In in their paper, they they do things with actions and that, that would make physicists happy, I'm sure, but like are confusing for me. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Right. So when when we get to the two groups, we'll see uh, definitely why um, I can scroll up also and say even even this, the fact that group cohomology in the uh, smooth setting is harder to define. So you don't have simply a map like this with some nice properties. You have to, um, you have to work with covers of your group and 
So, so everything just becomes a little bit more technical and you have more indices. Um, and we really thought, okay, we can do this in this toy case and that the general case would be totally out of reach. But we were sort of pleasantly surprised that um, our methods don't work, but we, we see how we think we should modify them. So we're already started to have started to generalize our results to the uh, compact case. So the goal for this talk uh, is to explain how these structures of this line bundle and um, the vector space arise naturally when you study two groups. Um, so as I said, we're gonna focus on the case of the finite group G, which is uh, work on the archive with these uh, four collaborators. And then work in progress is for compact G and especially uh, the case of Tori to begin with, and that's joint with Danberg Adams. So let me start by telling you what a two group is. So it's a categorification of the idea of a group. And so rather than having a set with an operation, we're gonna have a category with an operation. And then rather than have axioms, equalities that hold, we're going to have natural isomorphisms is a monoidal groupoid. So a groupoid here is a category in which all morphisms are invertible and monoidal means we have a tensor structure. And the thing that makes it a group like object is that all objects have tensor inverses. Okay. So for every object C, you can find another object C inverse such that when you tensor them together, you get the unit object. Um, and there's different adjectives for your true group depending on whether you just want to say that tensor inverses exist or whether you want co coherent choices of tensor inverses for each um, object and whether you want to specify isomorphisms here. So there's slight variations in flavor, but um, we'll see in our example that it's pretty concrete. So as a question, but this tensor operation is assumed to be associative in which way? That's right. So it's weakly associative and that will be the key for us. What does it mean, weakly associative? Um, it will mean that we have- oh, Okay, you're getting there, okay. Don't worry, if you are getting there, then it's pointless for me to ask now, okay? So a result is useful for us. Um, so we started with this class in cohomology of G with coefficients in U1, um, and it classifies all two groups that are extensions of the ordinary group G by category that has only one object and U1 worth of automorphisms. And so both of these things are two groups in not very exciting ways. So every group is, has a, can be viewed as a category where the objects are the elements of the group and the morphisms are only identities. So we have no interesting morphisms and we have a tensor structure given by multiplication. In this category, we have only one object but we have morphisms which compose using group multiplication in U1. And we also have, we can also type the tensor product of two morphisms again using group multiplication in U1. And in fact, this works for any abelian group. So I can replace this by point mod A and this can be any abelian group. And so I'm gonna give a concrete example in the finite case of what I mean by an extension of G by point mod U1, but I just wanted to, um, cite the appropriate people. So this theorem is proven by Sin in her thesis. So Sin was a graduate student of Groth and Dieck, um, but her thesis is not published. So then it was published um, by Baez and Lauda. And Shomer Pries later described the smooth group setting. So we really wanna take into account that U1 is um, a Lie group itself or any abelian Lie group. And we deal with siegel Mitchison and cohomology, whatever that is. But I, again, for this talk, we're really interested in the finite case. And so here's the example. We have our finite group. We have a co-cycle representing this class in cohomology, and we define a monoidal category, curly G. And so to do that, I need to tell you it's objects, it's morphisms, it's tensor structure, and then it's associator. Um, so the objects are just going to be the elements of G. The morphisms, between any two elements, um, there's either no morphisms if G is different from H, or there's a whole copy of A1 of A if G is equal to H. And so that's different from this ordinary group G where we had no interesting morphisms at all. Now we have an entire copy of A every time for, for the automorphisms of any element. 
the tensor product, I'm just going to take using the group multiplication. But the associator, I'm going to use um, alpha. So what is the associator? It's a rule that tells me that if I take the tensor product of G with H and then tensor that with K, that should be isomorphic to taking the tensor product of G with the product of H and K. So we want a morphism like this. Now, luckily, G, we know that these two things are actually equal as objects in our category. And so the Hom space from here to here is a copy of A. And so I need to produce for every triple G, H, and K, an element of A. And what we take is alpha G, H. Is A a torus? A is an abelian. Actually, for this example, it doesn't need to be a Lie group. So any abelian group will work. Is it compact? At this stage, no. At this stage, there's no topology. So this is everything is an abstract group. But what we do want to work with is often U1. So yes, in that case, yes. So then the, the associators tell me that tensoring G and H with K is the same thing as tensoring G with H and K. And then in a group, we would just say that these two things should be equal. And that would be the end of the story. That's the associativity. But now that we've just said that these are isomorphisms, now we can ask, well, if we tensored four elements together, we would have lots of ways of moving around the brackets. And we want those to be compatible with each other. So for those who have seen monoidal categories, this is what's called the Pentagon axiom. And it turns out that the fact that our associators that we just defined using our co-cycle do satisfy the Pentagon axiom is actually exactly equivalent to the co-cycle condition. And so this is what this is the structure that I described as a, an extension. So we have our category G. It surjects onto the boring category from the ordinary group G that just forgets about all the morphisms. So that's a surjection. And inside of it, what, what's left when we've taken that quotient, it's just the automorphisms. So it's, it's one object, but A worth of morphisms. We have what we call a short exact sequence like this, and G is an extension. And so the result of, of Sin and later Baez and Lauda is that any two group that has finitely many isomorphism classes of objects is of this form. It's, it's equivalent to a category like this. And furthermore, if we took two co-cycles that were in fact cohomologous, give the same class in cohomology, then we could show that our, we would have an isomorphism between our two groups. So can I ask, is this a... a some kind of way of, uh, in an oblique way, to refer to a central extension of the group by A or something like that, or not? No, it's something else. Yeah, so central extensions of G by A are classified by two cocycles. Ah, right, yeah, okay. So gone up one categorical level, and that means that our A is no longer the objects, it's the morphisms. And so this guy is a category, it's not really a group. Okay, and so now we want to go to the case that A is a torus, perhaps, yeah. And so then we can view it as a smooth object. Um, so for experts, I mean a group object in, in the two category of bi-bundles, but for non-experts, I just mean that suddenly our morphisms, a uh, smooth manifold structure, and our all of our um, operations, composition, and, and tensor product of morphisms are compatible with that. Um, and so I did want to mention a few non-finite examples of uh, two groups, um, sort of as motivation and also to see uh, how the story gets more complicated. So one main source of motivation for studying uh, two groups is the string group. Um, so there's a model of the string group given by Chris schumer Pries that says that the string group is a central extension of spin n by point mod u1, and it's classified by the generator of h3, which turns out to be z as long as n is at least five. And so one major advantage of working with two groups instead of ordinary groups is that, okay, string n, yes, it's a category. It's not a set anymore. Things aren't strict. We need to keep track of associators, but it still has, um, its objects form a well understood Lie group, finite dimensional Lie group. And so prior to, to this description using two groups, people had models of the string group that used infinite dimensional manifolds and so caused different sorts of headaches. 
Um, another example, so this is sort of the next easiest example after the finite case is the abelian case. So let's start with a torus. So he is some number of copies of, of U1 with Lie algebra, I'm going to denote it by T and co-weight lattice and the check. And so that means we have a short exact sequence of groups given by the exponential. And then we also, our next piece of input data, this is replacing alpha, is a bilinear form, integer values on the lattice. And we extend it to, so we extend it linearly to a map on T cross T. And so now we can define our two group. It, so I need to tell you its objects and its morphisms and its tensor structure. So the objects, Again, as I mentioned very briefly, when we're not in the finite case, I need to work with a cover of my group. So my objects are not just going to be elements of the, the group, they're going to be points of a cover of the group. But luckily we have a very nice cover of our group given by the Lie algebra. So our objects are elements of the Lie algebra and our morphisms between two points of the Lie algebra will be empty if these two points, they don't have to be equal now, but they do have to be equal in the group. So if their exponential is different, then we have no morphisms between them. But if their exponential is the same, then we have a U1 copy. And what does it mean for the exponential of X to be equal to the exponential of Y? It means that Y can be written as X plus M for some M in the lattice. And so to write a morphism, I'm gonna use this notation it's going to be a map from X into X plus M for some M, my Y, and I label my arrow by an element of U1. Now I've defined a category and I want to define a tensor structure on it. And in this case, so the tensor structure on the objects will again just use the underlying group structure on my Lie algebra, but the tensor structure on the morphisms is going to be more complicated. So let me take two morphisms, this, so that's one morphism, and I'm gonna tensor it with another morphism. Maybe this one is labeled by W, another element of U1. Well, we definitely know that force and target of this map need to be given by X plus Y and X plus Y plus M plus N. I get to label this map by any element of U1. And what we choose, is not just the product of Z times W, we choose the product of Z times W times E to the two pi I, and then we pair using J, our bilinear form, we pair Y and M, some formula that um, is described in, in Ganter's paper. Furthermore, um, it's actually strictly associative here. The category is a little bit more complicated in that it's not skeletal. So we have maps that are not automorphic. This is another example of a two -piece. Was was J the bilinear form on the Lie algebra? That's right. Oh yeah, okay, thank you. Which we've decided is maybe terrible notation because there will be other Js, but not in this talk. So for this talk, it's okay. So what I want to do in the rest of this talk um, is to define a moduli space of bundles for this two group and study the map from that moduli space into the ordinary moduli space of, of G bundles. And in the case that G is finite and X is a Riemann surface, this reproduces. Um, so it's some structure that when we take isomorphism classes, we recover the Friedkin line bundle. And in particular, that means that to give a section of, of this Friedkin line bundle, it means to give a lift from our underlying space to this new space that we define using two groups. So it's an isomorphism class of lists. So that's the goal. So we fix a smooth two group and a smooth manifold and a principal bundle for this manifold. So we more or less copy the definition of an ordinary two group, an ordinary bundle. So we should have a space, but in this case, that's gonna be a smooth stack living over X and it should be equipped with an action of G, which is locally trivial, meaning that there exists a surjective submersion call it U. So we have a nice space living over X, the cover, and over that space, we have an isomorphism. Could you please define the stack? Um, maybe, let me think about that while I write the rest of the sentence of G over Y. Yes, I can. Um, so what I mean, G, sorry. 
spaces on Y. I'm gonna call it D and it's a map from the pullback of P to the trivial G bundle. What's the trivial G bundle? It's just Y cross G. So answer the question, what do I mean by a stack? For me, I mean a Lie groupoid, meaning a space, a pair of spaces like this. These are going to be the objects of the space and these are the collection of all the morphisms. So I have some arrows, source and target, and I have an arrow going the other way that sends P to the identity morphism of P. And then I have some composition. So that's a stack for us. Did that help at all? Well, at the first passage, uh, you're assuming everyone knows this already? No, I am assuming that we can all just think it's a space with a, some kind of symmetry. So apart from this word stack, which as you pointed out, is maybe not fair to throw in, if I had said space and I had not written a curly G, this looks exactly like the definition of a, a principal bundle. As you point out, stacks are a little bit more complicated. And so just one thing to highlight, really the only thing to keep in mind is that, for example, when I have an action, so that should be a map that goes from P cross G into P. I want it to satisfy the action axioms, namely that acting by the identity should be the same as doing nothing, and that acting by two elements consecutively should be the same as acting by their product. But now when I say two things are the same, I don't mean that they're equal. I mean that I should have an isomorphism between those things. And so this action also comes equipped with, with extra data that makes it an action in this categorical setting. But what does this really mean? Well, just like in the classical setting, when we actually want to work with bundles, what we often do is we start with a cover, we start with trivial bundles over the cover, and then we glue them together. And we do this using transition functions or what we've called check, check data. Um, so in particular, just like for a two group, uh, an ordinary bundle, the first level of gluing data is some kind of transition function on your twofold, your intersections of pieces of your open cover. So you have the trivial bundle on there and you have an automorphism of it with itself. But in this case, um, this automorphism is given by something called a bi-bundle. I haven't told you at all what that is, but in particular, there's an A bundle living in this picture. And we want to choose our cover Y such that that A bundle is trivial. So we may need to take a, a finer cover than usual, but we can always refine our cover until that's true. And then this gluing data actually boils down to the following three pieces of information. It's U, a map from Y to X, so it, our cover. Rho, this is our transition function from intersections of the cover with itself into our group G. But now the fact that the transition function should satisfy co-cycle conditions on triple overlaps, that fact that it's satisfying that is no longer an equality, it's an isomorphism, and that isomorphism is given by something that we call gamma, living on, again, these triple overlaps. And it's a map into A because those are our automorphisms and these should satisfy some conditions. So instead of, we no longer have any stacks in the picture is, is the point of this result that we really just have three maps that have some compatibility with each other. And as an example, um, in this context, an A gerb, okay, so this is a, a fancy word that people like, but it's just a principal bundle, principal bundle for the group point mod A which has one object and amorphisms over X. And in terms of our check data here, so we need our U, a nice cover. Now this is nothing and because our group G is just the group with one element. So rho is trivial and gamma is a map from, let me call it to avoid repeating so many factors. So the threefold product of X into A, which is a check two co cycle. And okay, maybe this is not every author's definition of an A gerb, but every author eventually comes to the point that A gerbs up to isomorphism are classified by second cohomology of A. Um, and if we compute that using this check cover, that's exactly what we get here. So this recovers that story. Um, let me skip this part so that there is more time for questions. So we don't need two gerbs. 
But we do have um, from these results, so we have a forgetful functor, pi, um, these two group bundles, two ordinary bundles. And what does it do in terms of check data? It takes a triple u rho and gamma and just forgets about the gamma. And so this functor was our first tool for trying to understand what this space looks like. We ask, what do the fibers look like of, of this forgetting, forgetting gamma business? And so the result is that for G, a finite two group, so given by a finite group and abelian Lie group and a three co-cycle, this map pi is a torsor over the symmetric hoidal bicategory of gerbs. So we have an action of this symmetric monoidal bicategory on this space. And why is this, maybe you should say, why is this a symmetric monoidal bicategory? Um, I said that the data of an A gerb is given by U and gamma, but now we're landing in abelian groups, so we can we can add gammas, and that's that's just the structure. And what's the action? If I have a triple U rho and gamma, and then I have another two co-cycle, I can I can modify this gamma by acting, and it won't change the co-cycle conditions. So using the check data, we can make this very explicit, um, but I think that I will not that now. Yeah, but basically what we have to do, I'll just say this, the fiber over a point in the base, so that's a principal bundle, which is determined by a cover and some gluing data, is given by the choices of gamma that complete the triple. U rho gamma. And so we just study that and we can identify it with this category. Let me explain this a little bit from the homotopy theory perspective in case this is your preferred perspective on G bundles. So what a homotopy theorist would tell you is that if you have the correct definition for these objects, there should be a classifying space and maps from X into BG should classify G bundles on X. Let's try to think about that. So first of all, what would be GB? And here's our proposal. So we have the classifying space for the ordinary group G. And now our alpha is a three coast cycle. And so what that does for us is it produces a map like this to the threefold classifying space of A. Because A is abelian, we can just keep taking the classifying space. Now we have a point living over here. And when we pull back along alpha, this is our definition of B of G. So let's see if that's a good definition, what would it mean to give a map from X into this space? Well, first of all, I should give a map into here, that's no data. And then secondly, I should give a map here. I'm gonna denote it by row, but that's just a G bundle, an ordinary group bundle. And then in order to actually get something to the pullback, I furthermore need the condition that um, this diagram commutes so that alpha composed with rho should be isomorphic to the map from X into B3 of A, which is factors through a point. So that's the trivial two gerb, it turns out, but I skipped two gerbs, so I can't say that. And this data here exactly turns out to be a gamma of the form that we needed. So that's our fibers. So, um, right. so if you prefer a classifying space perspective, you get, the same story. So what we do next is we talk about flat G bundles. Now in the finite case, the classical finite case, there's no difference between flat and not flat G bundles, but here we have this copy of U1 floating around. And so we can talk about flatness in a meaningful way. And in general, for any two group, a flat curly G bundle is a principal bundle G delta which is we take the same underlying structure, but we give it the discrete topology. In other words, all of our transition functions should be locally constant. And the key result here from the classical setting is that a um, flat principal G bundles for a Lie group G are classified by homomorphisms from pi one of X into G. Um, and more precisely, let me write this here. So I'm gonna denote when I want to talk about flat bundles, I'm going to put a little flat symbol in my music days. And that's equivalent to the functors from point mod pi one x to point mod g, or equivalently, 
This is homomorphisms of groups from pi one of X to G, where we have an action by conjugation by G. Okay, so that's the classical story. And what we prove is that for G finite and X with contractible universal cover, for example, a Riemann surface that, so we have our flat bundles here. We have this map that we've studied. We understand the fibers and we can complete this diagram. And in here we have homomorphisms of bi categories from point mod the fundamental group to point mod G. I'll say in a minute a little bit about what, what the objects of that thing. Were. So we have a compatible story um, in the geometric language and in kind of the algebraic language, the, the representation variety. So let me say what I mean, for example, by a homomorphism from pi one, which is an ordinary group into curly G, which is a two group. So first of all, I should have a homomorphism to the ordinary group. So the fact that it's a homomorphism tells me that for every pair of elements, A and B in pi one of X, um, I can multiply row A and row B, or I can multiply A and B and apply row, and that should be isomorphic. And so I'm going to specify an isomorphism and I'm going to call it gamma of AB. And so these rows and gammas have the same names as the rows and gammas that appeared here because they really are the same corresponding data in this condition. And similarly, there's an idea of conjugating one homomorphism to another that again comes with an element and some extra data. So I will skip that and get to the punchline. My time is running out. Um, so the language that we have here, mm, sorry, makes it clear that there's a G action downstairs and that that really tells us all of the morphisms in this category. And similarly, it turns out that we can lift that action upstairs. I'll just write that here. There are compatible G actions. And the corollary is that um, this map pi from flat curly G bundles to flat classical bundles is a cloven two vibration. Okay, so that's some category theory word, but one thing that it tells us is, well, anytime I have a, map, a functor between categories and I talk about fibers, you might ask me whether I mean a strict fiber or a homotopy fiber or something more general. And when I have a two vibration, it turns out it doesn't matter. They're the same, they're equivalent. And so I don't have to worry. Um, and so one thing that what this buys us is that um, we have a construction. So can explicitly isomorphism classes within fibers. So that is what this, this technical work has bought us. And finally, we will use it. Um, so, so far we've seen that we have this two vibration and the fibers are given by gerbs for U1, flat gerbs now, okay. And so, as I said, we can take isomorphism classes along fibers, but isomorphism classes along fibers are isomorphism classes of gerbs, which we saw were the same as H2 of U1. And now we're working over Riemann surface. So this is U1. And so what we end up with is a bundle over the moduli space of G bundles whose fibers are U1. And the G equivariance is built in. So as someone asked at the very beginning, what does it mean to have a bundle on a finite set of points? The key thing is, is G equivariance and that comes along for the ride. Okay, and so then our theorem is that um, the associated line bundle to this principle U1 bundle is the Friedkin line bundle, which we called Lx or L sigma before. Um, and I have a reference here um, to a paper by Willerton who studied the case that X was a torus. And he also worked with two groups and he, had, he didn't use two group bundles, but he did also produce a line bundle. Um, and he showed that it was the Friedkin line bundle. And that was the first example that we did. And we compared with his work and that gave us the idea to, to look at Friedkin more generally. And so I think I'm out of time, but I'll just say out loud that the work in progress then is to study two group bundles for um, general compact G, uh, especially starting with tori. And then we don't have 
the Fried Quinn line bundle to get, but we do have this pre-quantum line bundle that we're looking for. And we have shown for a torus, um, both the space is a topological torus and the group is a, an algebraic torus that we do get the um, pre-quantum line bundle from Chern Simon's theory that we expect. So I'll stop there and thank you. Thank you, Emily, for the very nice talk. So we have time for some questions. If uh, people would like to raise their hand, or you can just go ahead if uh, you're the first in line. I guess I'd like to just ask you if you could make a little more contact with physics. Uh, the only word that you said that sounded to me at least familiar from a physicist's viewpoint was churn Simon's theory, but I didn't really get the gist of what your construction has to say uh, to physicists. Right. Um, okay. So, yeah. So, at this stage, um, nothing. At this stage, we have no new results that physicists didn't already know. But we do have. Right. So, so a question is. Um, let me see. I wrote some things here that are useful. Um, so. We do produce a line bundle, which is the line bundle that, that physicists then polarize to produce um, quantum states in Chern Simon's theory. But we produce it by taking isomorphism classes in the category. And so we have more structure, and then we forget a bunch of the structure and we produce something that physicists are interested in. So an, a question is whether all the extra structure that we had to forget to get to what you care about was that extra structure useless and boring? Or is there more information there? And what physicists are currently studying is just a shadow of all the structure that is there. And so one obvious question that we could ask, like we have this line bundle, um, topologically, we have this line bundle, but to, um, like, um, to polarize it, we, we wanna work with um, a holomorphic structure and so on and so forth. And so far, we have not produced that holomorphic structure from the geometric story. We don't see it at the level of the two category that we're taking isomorphism classes of. But maybe we, hopefully we can. Um, and so then we can ask whether that information that we're forgetting was important and, and what we can learn from that. I don't know if that's helpful. Are there any other questions? Uh, just a simple one following up on what John said. So you did mention Chern Simon's theory. Um, just wondering if this is all applicable also to non-abelian Chern Simon's theory, or are you focused on abelian Chern Simon's theory? Yeah, I am not qualified to com comment yet. So we've just finished with the babyest of baby cases, which is the digraph Witten. Um, so we'll have to see. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I guess one other point of contact I can, so ultimately one of the goals is to better understand the string group and when the string group is acting on things. So anything that we can do currently with the spin group and spin structures and Dirac operators, can we even formulate the same questions using string structures? And for that, we need to understand bundles for, for the string group, which currently we don't. And the string group, is it, um... Is it related to string theory? Usually, we usually focus think, on uh, Lorentz spin group, Lorentz group, so forth. I think that's why it's got to me. Okay, good. Uh, any other questions? Okay, if not, let's thank Emily again for her talk. Thank you very much. Thank you.